Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality Reimagine. I'm an award-winning photographer and Photoshop artist that specializes in fantasy composite art. Today we're going to have episode 13 of the shop vlog, but really it's like episode 12.5 or episode 12 part two, because in episode 12 of the shop vlog, where I take an image from start to art, we approached with a theme to digital photo editing, and that theme is problem solving. So I took an image and started problem solving it based upon the issues that I saw in the image and what I could do to solve those, starting with Adobe Camera Raw, going through the retouching process, and exploring some things like the rule of thirds, which is a basic rule of photography and beyond. Then I put the video out to the channel and I asked all of you to let me know in the comments if you would like to see a continuation of that image and a continuation of the problem solving. And there were a lot of comments that said yes, they'd like to see that. So this is episode 13, that continuation from this previous image that we worked on in episode 12 of the shop vlog. Now this content was supposed to come out to the channel uh, last weekend, but it has been delayed. And the reason for that delay and a lot of the reasons for certain delays on this channel and things that are to come, I have started exploring in a new series that I will do once a month, which is a personal vlog called Artist Heal Thyself. This is not an Oprah episode where I'm going to talk to you about my intimate personal life. I'm going to talk to you about the challenges that I have in my career and in my business working life and some things in my personal life that affect all of that. I want to share with you what I'm going through, the things that I deal with on a case by case basis and the things that I use as inspirations, as guides to get through all of that with the hope that some of that experience that I go through, you can take some wisdom from that as well. But let's get going with episode 13, 12.5 part two today, where we're going to problem solve and continue this beautiful boudoir image through the photoshops and make some lovely art. To get us started, this image was sent in by my wonderful friend Sherry Hulse with Sherry Hulse Photography. You can see more of her amazing artwork by visiting the Instagram account at the link below. So as I mentioned, we went through the process of processing this image in Adobe Camera Raw, going through the retouch on all those different elements to get us to this place. And this is where we ended in episode 12. So let's continue forward. What is the first problem that we see in this image? I can wait. Does anybody want to say anything? It's the background and how the wooden palette wall that we see here does not extend all the way through in this composition. Now, this is a typical problem that happens when you use backdrops or elements like this in a studio or even outside in outdoor locations where you have an object of interest behind the subject that is not wide enough to fit the overall composition that you've chosen. Now, through my travels and education, I've encountered folks that say, well, I would just dismiss this image. It sucks, but you know, I'm just going to dismiss it because I don't know how to solve that issue. I don't know what to do in Photoshop to do all of that. And that's totally fine. If you don't, there'll be some folks who will say, I'm going to use the crop tool and completely crop this in and change the overall composition simply to solve this problem. That's okay too. If you don't know those things, that's what this episode is all about and trying to explore some of those basic ideas and the basic things that we can do in Photoshop. But before we start exploring those techniques in Photoshop to how to solve this, I want to talk about problem solving and taking a step back with this image to think about the photography itself. When I approach a photography session, I generally am generating ideas in my mind of imagery that I want to see, the feelings, the stories that they need to tell. I will communicate that to the model, to the subject and say, hey, let's work through this. And I give them guidance and the pose. I give them emotions to portray and story bits to work with to create the artwork. I think about the lighting and what kind of lights I need to put into the scene, what lighting modifiers, the power of the lights, the colors that we need to see. These are normal things that we go through to to be able to problem solve our creative vision before we ever take an image. Now, part of that problem solving that is often overlooked, and I understand why I'm guilty of it too sometimes, is to problem solve the set itself. So in this case, if I were Sherry at this shoot and I saw this background, of course, realizing immediately that the wooden palette wall does not go the entire length of the composition, which she did. But then the famous phrase is uttered, which is, I'll just figure it out in Photoshop later. Sometimes you can do that. We're certainly going to explore that today. But one of the things that I want to strongly urge and recommend is to take a step back in that moment. When you see the set and you go, oh man, that's not going to be wide enough to fit this, but oh well, I'll fix it in Photoshop. Take a step back. What can you do? So if I were Sherry and I were photographing, I would continue getting frames and shots, looking at the, the, 
subjects and seeing the story and so forth. And then when I saw this image in back of camera, I would know I'm hitting the art that I want to see. And when that happens, I do not stop the shoot. I don't take a moment to look at it and go through all my images and congratulate myself, talk to people, talk to the model. I continue getting like another 10 to 15 frames. I give encouragement to the model. Oh my gosh, this is a beautiful image. Let's keep going. Turn your chin a little bit this way. Do this. Give me that story. Give me that feeling. And I'll get those 10 to 15 frames. And once I'm done with that, I take a deep breath and I look around and I remember how I'm setting on the ground, how the camera is in my hands. I don't change the framing. I don't change the lights. I change nothing. And I simply say, okay, I think we've got it for this series. Hey model, would you mind stepping out of the frame real quick? She'll get up and move, and then I will capture an image of the set as if she were there, but without her there. The lights, everything the same, and that's called capturing a plate shot, a plate image. And that plate can be used to problem solve this issue with that background not extending the width of the composition itself. Because simply, we would have all of this material, this wooden pallet wall, to work with to bring it in to fill in these two sections of the composition. Now, in Photoshop, there's a multitude of ways we can explore solving this problem. We can use some of the basic tools like the clone stamp tool and start cloning things over and trying to fill it in. We can use artificial intelligence and let Skynet figure out what we want and put it into the selections itself. And as I've talked about in previous videos on the channel, AI technology is wonderful and it generally gives you about a 75% good result where most of what it did looks okay, but there's always about a quarter of it that doesn't. And that requires you to use use tools like the clone stamp tool or other things with your human brain to solve the issues of artificial intelligence. If we had a plate shot, we could use that material and drop it in very easily because again, the model would not be in the way of all of that. So what I want to do is to take that systemic, simple approach to this problem solving, which is to say, okay, well, but there is enough of the wall that we can see. Can we make some selections of that? Use that on multiple layers to just kind of make up our new wall and also solve another issue that we have with this palette wall. Now, what I'm about to say, I do not mean this as a negative reflection upon the studio owner. This is a beautiful set and I absolutely love it, but it is not symmetrical. So we have a two by four here and a two by four there, a vertical piece of wood going up and down, but we don't have a third one here. Symmetry is one of the easiest ways to be able to create artistic harmony in your images and to get the audience to really feel the impact of the art. Now there's nothing against or nothing wrong with asymmetry. Asymmetry can be very powerful, but especially when you're taking an image of a human subject or a living subject, you want to try to incorporate as much symmetry as you can because those portraits have impact. Our human brains see the order and structure of the image and that's pleasing to us. People will love the image and may not even realize why, and it's because of that symmetry. So we can solve that problem today by making up a new wall, and that's what we're going to do. So the first thing that I want to do is to use the marquee tool, and I'm going to make a selection of the wall that's inside of the two by four here, and will give us enough material to start working on this side of the document. So while I'm on the background layer, I'm gonna make the marquee selection and bring it down all the way to right before we hit her knee. And I'm gonna stretch this over just a little bit. Now with that active selection in place, I'm gonna hit Control or Command and the letter J for duplicate. When I do that, I now have a new layer with all of that material to work with. So I'm going to hit V for the move tool and bring this over to the left side of our document and just slide it right up against that two by four. I'm using the arrow keys to nudge it over just a little bit and then take a look. And yeah, that looks really good. So for one issue, it is literally a mirror of this here. So this is a recognizable pattern that the audience is going to see. Now we want the audience to come in and, and view the model first and stay with her, but as they travel around the image, they're going to start seeing the recognizable pattern and then go, oh, they just moved the wall over yada 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 and some of the magic of your art is lost. Now there are a few things that we can do with this layer to try to mask that or try to hide it from the audience. But this is another opportunity for us to take a step back and think about problem solving solving overall. Yes, I know what I'm going to do with this layer to solve this, but what else can I do across the entire image, across the artwork to distract the audience from seeing this, to motivate the audience to say, don't look out here, 
Just look into the center at the beautiful model in the center of this boudoir image. I'm going to use a vignette. A vignette is essentially a darker outer perimeter where the interior is brighter. That darker outer perimeter promotes the audience to view wherever we drive their focus, but at the same time, it hides some of these elements. A vignette not only solves our problem of the wall or recognizable patterns, a vignette fits into the overall art paradigm of this image anyway. This is a dark, dramatically lit boudoir image. It's beautiful. So we can add a vignette to that that fits into the art. If this was a, a high key image with a lot of bright lights and so forth, a vignette would not work. It would just seem out of place. So in this case, by taking that step back, we can look at the art and go, I know how to problem solve this because I've done a vignette before. And I look at this and go, okay, this is a recognizable pattern. What can I do with it? Well, let's explore that right now. So I'm gonna to come to layer number one, which is the thing that we just created. And all I want to do is to flip this around and move it around. So I wanna flip it vertically so that the bottom becomes the top. To do that, I'm gonna come up to edit, down to transform, and then to flip vertical. Now, if you also notice here, flip vertical, flip horizontal, warp and perspective, I have changed the hotkeys to do these functions. So the F keys of F11, F8, F10, and F9, if I were to hit that, it will do precisely this because I use these functions in Photoshop all the time. So changing the hotkeys in Photoshop, if that's something you would like to see and a quick little tutorial on that, let me know in the comments below and I will happily make that for you all. So I'm going to go ahead and flip this vertical by clicking that and instantaneously everything is flipped. Now the patterns are a little bit different, but we have a new problem. What's that problem? Let's continue forward and it'll kind of stand out to you, but if you've already figured it out, right on. So let's move forward and fill in this bottom section here. So I'm going to do kind of the same thing, but I want to borrow different material. Why? Because I don't want those recognizable patterns or I want to do as much as I can to eliminate the recognizable patterns. So I'm going to use the marquee tool again. I'm going to come over to the right side of the wooden pallet wall, stay inside that two by four come down and out just a little bit, make sure that I'm not touching the model with the marquee selection so part of her hair won't be in this. Then hit Control or Command, the letter J to duplicate. Then hit V for the Move tool, drag this over, kind of align it where I need it to be, fitting up against that wooden wall, taking a peek and seeing how it's all coming into play. That looks pretty good. We've got to make sure that it matches up to the floor down here, but we can work with it with a layer mask or we can actually use a, a very easy method of solving this, which is to select the layer itself that we just created. And on the move tool, we want to make sure that this box is checked, which says show transform controls. That will show us these little boxes around the entire perimeter. This enables us to very easily resize this. So if I were to move the cursor to the corner here and start dragging it, all the sides are resized together at once and they're being the same. This is called constraining proportions where the interior pixels are staying the overall proportion. They're not being stretched. But if I were to hold shift and grab a side middle corner and start doing this, now I'm stretching the material itself by holding shift. I'm no longer constraining the proportions. Now the pixels inside the overall image, the, the wooden pallet wall, these pixels are being stretched. So the more that I do this, the more that I'm going to lose integrity of those pixels and it'll start to look fake. If I hold the control key or the command key and come to a corner, instead of it constraining proportions, now I'm distorting the imagery inside. So these are three different easy methods to start working with this material to quickly shape it to your needs. Now what I'm going to do is come to the middle box and hold shift and simply stretch this until I align it to meet with the hardwood floor right at the base of this image. So that fits. Everything looks good. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter to accept those transformations. Now I'm temporarily going to turn off this show transform controls so we don't see that blue line around it so we can see the material. Now take a look at this. Ignore the rest of the little paper and the backdrops in the studio. What's the problem here? The luminosity values are not matching. So here we have a brighter wooden pallet wall because the lights are coming in and hitting it. It should get darker as it travels outward but it's dark right here and brighter over here. This is a little bit darker. This is brighter up top. This is a issue of flipping vertically and horizontally and so forth. So let's try to see if we can reorient these two layers so that the brighter parts will be closer to the center of our overall document. So I'm gonna uh, make sure that I'm on this second layer here. I'm gonna turn on those transform controls again. Now I'm gonna come back up to edit, transform, 
and flip horizontal. Now that brighter selection and section of the wood is closer to the center. The darker one is further out. Let's go to the top one and flip it horizontally as well. Transform, flip horizontal, and take a peek and see what we have. The darker part is still in, in sign and closer, so it, it's not helping us here. The brighter part is further out. I'm going to hit Control or Command and the letter Z to go one step back in my history. I do want that brighter part to be inside. Ultimately, flipping this horizontally vertically is not going to get us where we're going to solve the problem. We're probably going to have to use some sort of an adjustment layer that deals with luminosity values, that deals with light to try to bring this down. Now, yes, the vignette will make this outer perimeter darker, but think about this. If we do the vignette, it's going to make this area here, which is already dark, even darker disproportionately to this section that we just created. So we have to problem solve. How do we do that? Well, let's go ahead and put these two layers together so they will become one layer by themselves. To do that, I'm selecting both of these by holding the shift key, and then I'm going to hit control or command and the letter E that will combine them and merge them down into one layer itself. Now, with that layer active, I'm going to come down to my adjustment window, and I'm going to make an exposure adjustment layer. I could do levels and curves, but I want to do exposure because exposure gives me the ability to adjust the gamma correction of the light, which simply gives me more of a pure dark tone rather than dealing with curves and levels. And that's an explanation of a lot of science of Photoshop at a later time. So with this exposure adjustment layer created now on the top of the layer stack, I need it to clip to this layer that we just made of the wooden pellet wall so that it will only affect that and not the actual background layer itself. So to do that, I'm gonna come up to select, uh, not select, layer. Yes, layer and then create clipping mask. As you can see, I have the F7 key bound to this because I do this quite often, which is why it's hard for me to immediately remember how to get to it because I use the hotkeys. So just as a side note, pro tip, if you get used to the hotkeys, which you should because they'll save you all types of time, all kinds of time in Photoshop, it may also help you to forget where the actual tools are located in the file menu. But anyway, so I'm going to go ahead and create the clipping mask. So now this is clipped down to this layer and it will only affect that layer. So I want to immediately take this gamma correction here. I'm going to take it to the side, which makes everything darker. Now this is making it obviously too dark. That's okay. We're going to utilize this layer mask to bring in this overall effect of the exposure adjustment layer selectively where we need it to be. I'm going to take the exposure itself and bring that down just a little bit. Now this is a white mask or a reveal all, so we can see the entire effect of this exposure adjustment layer. I don't wanna do that, I only wanna paint it in where I selectively want it to be. So I'm going to invert this layer mask, first making sure that it's selected, and then hit Control or Command and the letter I for invert. Now it's a black mask or a hide all, so we cannot see the effect until we paint white onto that mask. So I'm gonna hit B for brush, change my foreground color from white to black so that I'm painting with white on the black layer mask. And I'm gonna change the flow of my brush to let's say 10% by hitting shift and the number one key on the keyboard, which will take it to 10%. Now I'm gonna start gently painting white onto the mask, which is revealing this. That's a little too heavy handed, so I'm gonna switch my flow to 5%. And I'm also using a Wacom Intos Pro tablet. So the lighter that I touch the pen to the tablet, pressure sensitivity comes into play and gives me a little bit more soft control there. So now using this exposure adjustment layer, the luminosity values, they're matching pretty well. And it's pretty believable that this is a normal lighting pattern that's cascading out. So let's come back down to this background layer, the original one, select it, hit S for the clone stamp tool. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit, and I'm going to use the clone stamp tool to just copy the floor from down here and bring it up here and cover this up. I'm coming down here and using this, and I know immediately that the lines that we see in this diagonal, they're not going to match up here. But I'm selecting it down here because this is a wood laminate floor that is reflecting the actual paper that we see here. So I can see the reflection. So if I start copying here, I'm just going to reintroduce that as I travel upward. So coming down to the base here, hit Alter Option to select a target area of the material you want to copy, and then just start copying it over. Now the detail, again, is not going to match. That's okay. The luminosity values may not match as much as I would prefer, but that's okay because, again, we know from an art perspective, we're going to use that vignette to try to mask everything. Now what I'm doing is I change the flow of my... Con uh, clone stamp 
to a flow of 10% so that it's just gently copying some of this material in. And I'm doing that because I'm trying to mask those little reflections just a little bit. Not too much because if I was at 100% flow, then we would definitely see some different patterns and the overall vignettes that we create may not match all of that. So that looks pretty good. I'm gonna come back up to the new layer that we made because as I look here, it's not really matching up right to that floor itself and that's bothering me. So again, using one of those new things that we just talked about with this corner control here, I'm going to hold down the controller command key and then simply distort this until it goes up and matches a little bit more to that floor. And I think that looks pretty good. And then I'm gonna grab this outer control and bring this down just a little bit. I don't wanna to go too far because as you can see, these straight lines through here are starting to tilt downward a lot, which can stand out and cause some issues. So I just want to realign that just a little bit, hit enter to accept that transformation. Okay, that looks good. While we're on the background layer, I'm going to go back to my clone stamp tool, again on that low flow of 10%, and just copy a little bit more of that material up there to hide those papers and the, the reflections that we may or may not have seen. So now taking a step all the way back by hitting control or command and the number zero on the keyboard and then zooming out just a little bit further by hitting control or command and the minus key, let's solve this issue over here. So same principle that we did before, but this time I need to actually grab this two by four here because again, I want to create symmetry by having a two by four on this side. So to help me out, I'm gonna turn off this layer that we just created so that I can see the edge of the two by four. Now with the background layer selected, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so that I can see the overall wall, grab my marquee tool, I need to stay inside the two by four, and this is not actually very straight. So if I bring this guide over just so I can see, the guide down here is inside the two by four and we're well inside of it at the top. Let me hit V for the move tool and bring this over just a little bit more. This guide will make it very easy to be able to use the marquee tool to make this selection. And if you've never seen a guide like this before, you don't know how to make that, and you're new to this channel, welcome. Take a look at the card above. It will take you to episode 12 of the shop vlog. I explain how to set up your rulers and get those guides into your image. So with the marquee tool selected, I'm just gonna simply go down at the edge of that two by four, and I'm gonna go pretty much all the way to the edge, which means that we're bringing her leg into the shot and that's okay, or into the sample, that's fine. We'll just use the clone stamp tool to get rid of it because it's a relatively small selection here that we can easily replace with a clone stamp tool. So I have a good selection of material. I'm gonna hit Control or Command, the letter J to duplicate it. Then I'm gonna hit V for the move tool, bring it over and kind of align it up as best as I can. Zoom in just a little bit to make sure it's where it needs to be. It isn't because it's not meeting the floor. So I'm gonna nudge it down with the arrow keys just a little bit so we get to where we need it to be. Make sure that it, and so it's not fitting at the top. So let's use that new thing that we explored. We're coming to this middle control here, holding the shift key and stretching this until it goes right past the edge of the document. So we are making sure that there's no material left anywhere else. Hit enter to accept the transformation. Now let's go ahead and clone stamp out the leg. So I'm just zooming in a little bit, hitting S for the clone stamp tool. I need to change that flow back to 100% by hitting shift and the number zero on the keyboard. Now I'm just going to hit alter option, select the target area of the material I want to clone, painting that in at 100% flow and opacity, reducing the size of my brush just so that I can get down here to a fine edge or as fine of an edge as I can create. Copy some new material over just a little bit like that right there. Uh, see, as and this is part of the problem when you use the clone stamp tool. If you're not careful, it becomes very easy to start copying odd things that create distractions like extra lines and things that you don't need or the perimeter edge of the document and so forth. So with all of that in place, let's go to the background layer and I'm gonna grab this material here and fill in that wall just a touch. There we go. I did go past the line just a little bit right here. That's not the end of the world because again, that vignette's gonna cover up a lot for us. Now let's make that same exposure adjustment layer as we did before. Coming down to the adjustment window, exposure, and then I'm going to clip it to the layer instead of coming up to layer and doing all of that. Another hotkey that you can do is if you mouse, uh, put your uh, cursor between the two layers and then hold the alter option key, it will switch it to that square with a little arrow pointing down. That means now it's clipped to it. So same process as before. Let's go ahead and take the exposure down. Take the gamma correction down just a little bit. There we go. Invert the layer mask, control or command and letter I. Start painting white at a low flow. We're still at a flow of 5%, that's good. Our background color is still set to white. So let's just go ahead and start painting this in. 
and make sure that this is just a little bit darker than the rest of the wooden wall everywhere else. There we go. Cool. Now, turning the other one on, I'm going to get rid of this guy by coming up to view and down to clear guides. We have a new wooden pallet wall. We have symmetry. It all looks good. We need to add some other stuff to this, but we have a new problem. What is that problem? Think about it from a compositional perspective. We can see less material here on this side, but we can see more here. So the overall framing of this just doesn't fit and doesn't have that same harmony. So let's go ahead and flatten all of this down and combine everything together because I feel pretty good about the wooden wall and we need to resize the entire image now with the rule of thirds to kind of make everything fit where we need it to be. So I'm going to come up to layer and then come down to flatten image. Now we have just one layer. I need to unlock it because it's the background layer. So I'm going to come over to this icon here, click the little picture of the lock, which unlocks it and gives me those transform controls. Then I'm going to run a quick action that I created that makes the rule of third guides so I can see how the image is divided into the rule of thirds. Her face is still intersecting the third because that's what we did in episode 12. But now we need to resize this so that the wooden palette wall in the background fits more pleasingly into the overall composition. So I'm going to come to this corner here and start pulling this down. Again, the proportions are constrained. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at this edge and this edge, trying to make sure that there's roughly the same amount of material from this two by four to the edge of the document from this two by four to the edge of the document. So looking at this, I think that looks pretty good. Now holding alter option and coming to any other corner, I'm just going to resize the whole thing so that her head starts to get a little bit closer to that quadrant here of the third. It doesn't have to, like her nose doesn't have to be on the line or anything like that. I just want her face to generally be in there because again, this creates a pleasing composition based upon the rule of thirds. So I think that looks pretty good. And I'm gonna pull this down just a little bit more. Now hit enter to accept that transformation. Come up to view, clear the guides. And then let's go ahead and come to layer and flatten image to return this to the background layer itself. Now let's create that vignette and finish up this video for today. So my favorite way to create a vignette is to use a solid color adjustment layer. If you come down to the adjustment window and then make solid color adjustment layer, this happens to be on black. So the color picker is set to my foreground color, which is black. So I'm going to hit OK. Then I just need to change the blending mode of this so that I can see the layer below. I'm going to come down to soft light because that's the preferred blending mode that I like to use when I create a vignette this way. So now the entire image is darker. We have that white layer mask, so everything is being revealed. I need to paint black on the mask so that we can see her and cascade that outward so that the original luminosity will be visible in the center and it will travel outward to get darker as we get to the vignette. So my method of choice to do that is not to use the basic brush tool, but to use the gradient tool in Photoshop. So here is the gradient tool. I'm going to click it and then come up to the menus to change a couple of things. First, I wanna be on the radial gradient, which is this icon so that it will start painting circles as I transfer it out. And then I also want to make sure that I'm on a certain type of gradient. So when I click this menu, it's gonna bring down this whole list of different gradients. Now, this was new to Photoshop as of CC 2018, I believe. So if you're using an older version of Photoshop, when you click this this little arrow here you're going to see a window with a bunch of squares in it that have some of them have like rainbow colors and all kinds of different colors into them those are the default gradients that came with photoshop photoshop then expanded all of this categorized them all into different colors and so forth and made it a little bit more of a clean menu to work with so under the basics tab here i'm going to click that one i want to be on this particular gradient which is foreground color to transparency so that it's only going to use one color and then just feather it out on the mask when I use that gradient tool. So I'm clicking this. Now it's my foreground color set to white. So this is white to transparency. If I paint white on a, lay, a white layer mask, nothing's going to happen. So I need to switch my foreground color to black. The icon will change here. Now we can start using the radial gradient to start painting some black circles on this mask to expose the vignette. I've also changed the opacity of my gradient tool to 30% to achieve a softer effect because subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. So G for the gradient tool. 
clicking on the center and dragging out the gradient. And every time I do it, I'm making a very general big gradient. Let's take a look at the layer mask itself by hitting Alter Option and clicking the layer mask. So here, the center is the darkest black that's being painted onto the mask, and then it's just fading out. That transparency is fading out, so we see white. So that's how we're able to achieve this simple little gradient. Let's go ahead and do it just a little bit more. Here we go. And so now we can see some good detail through here. Everything looks good, but because we use those exposure adjustment layers, the luminosity values match. We're not gonna see too much of the reflections on the floor, or any other particular distractions or anything along those lines. So that simple vignette helped out tremendously. I'm gonna lower the opacity of the vignette globally, and I'm gonna take it down to like 75% because I like to do things like that because again, subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. I don't want one thing above all else to be at 100% because then the audience will only see that and it distracts them from the art itself. So quick before and after, the vignette adds that subtle little push into it. If you like stronger vignettes, go for it. I just personally like the vignette, but I want it to be built up. But I also want to use another artistic tool to add to the art, to add to the vignette, and to help me out with any of these issues so that the audience doesn't see recognizable patterns or any defects in the Photoshop work itself. And I typically will do this all the time with my images, which is to add a texture to the image as well. So this texture here from Adobe Stock, I purchased a long time ago, I use all the time. This is the file number for it so that you can go to Adobe Stock if you wish and purchase this specific piece of stock. This is, by its very nature, a JPEG, so it's an 8-bit image. I'm working in a 16-bit format. Bit depths and images I explore in the retouching series, so if you're new to the channel, again, welcome, but also please visit the retouching series. There's a card for it. It's because I explain bit depths, why it's important. I explain the clone stamp tool, retouching techniques, color grading techniques, all kinds of stuff to help you make artwork. It's well worth some of your time. Go to that retouching series when you're done with this video today. Since this is 8-bit, when I hit V for the move tool and I drag it into my new document and let go, I'm gonna get a warning from Photoshop that says essentially the two bit depths are different. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and proceed because I don't care that the bit depth is different for this particular piece of stock why? Because 16-bit enables you to use so many more colors in your image and in your artwork than 8-bit does. So essentially my limitation is I'm bringing something that is being limited by color by its nature of being 8-bit. That doesn't matter because this is white, black, and gray. I don't need any more subtle variations of the color because it has texture built into it as well. So we're not going to see any kind of banding lines in this. So I'm okay with that. Now, if this was a different piece of texture with colors in it, then I would change the bit depth from 8-bit to 16-bit. So with this in place, I'm gonna use soft light again, and that's going to let us be able to have that blending mode to see down and through so we can see the original artwork. So this adds just a little bit more texture, continues to disguise everything in the background, but it is also adding another vignette because if we go back to the normal blending mode, this has a built-in vignette to it. It's brighter in the center and it's darker on the outer perimeter. Let me go ahead and resize this just a little bit so that you can see uh, all of it. So I can make sure I can get as much of that material into the document as possible. So there's darker corners all around and that brighter section in the middle. So when I go to soft light, we're adding more of the vignette, we're adding more texture. It makes it more pleasing and interesting to look at except for one thing, which is the texture is all over her skin, and that just looks bad. For a beautiful, soft boudoir image, we don't want the model skin to look like she needs some lotion and some hydration and a mani-pedi real fast. So anyway, at this point, what we need to do now is to remove the texture from this piece of stock. I don't want to use a layer mask on this and paint out the stock image, the texture, because then she's going to look different because the luminosity values and everything else are not going to come into play. I just need to remove the texture from it. There's a very easy way to do this, and we've explored it in a previous video on the channel. I'm going to use the lasso tool to make a selection around her that's pretty close to her, but it doesn't have to be perfect and precise. So I'm hitting L for the lasso tool, which is this icon here. And then again, I'm just going to trace a very simple selection around her that's pretty close to her body. It doesn't have to be perfect. I just want to make sure that I get all the relevant parts of her, like her skin and so forth, into this gentle selection that I'm making 
with a gentle selection and my Bob Ross. All right, so now that we have the selection, we need to feather the edge of it because this is a very defined selection. So on this side and this side, once we're done with this technique of getting rid of the texture, it will be a very identifiable edge of what happened. We need to feather it, which means this edge becomes softer and softer and expands outward depending upon the level of feather that we put into it. So to make that feathered selection, I'm gonna come up to select, down to modify and then feather and a feather radius of 100 actually will be just fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. The lasso outer, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, selection itself, the marching ants changes just a little bit to kind of reflect all of that. Now I'm gonna come up to, while this texture is selected, I'm gonna come up to filter, blur, Gaussian blur. Give it a very hefty blur of 182%, seems good, or 182 pixels, looks fine. And then I'm gonna hit controller command and letter D to deselect. Now. Technically, the texture is missing from that perimeter edge right here, but it transfers out so evenly, the wood palette wall has a nice texture behind it already that nobody's ever going to see the difference. So before, without that texture, without that extra vignette, and after. And again, subtlety is key inside of Photoshop, so let's go ahead and globally reduce the opacity of that just a little bit. Here we go, before and after. Now there's many more things we can do to this as far as adding colors to it and adding more contrast and sharpness, the fundamentals of Photoshop, color, luminosity, and detail. We can explore each one of those to color grade this and to add more art to it. But we've done that a lot in the retouching series on the shop vlog and so forth. Utilize some of those basic tools like a selective color adjustment layer or to use the color balance adjustment layer, to use a solid color adjustment layer and to start working with it to infuse color into the scene. Use things like the unsharp mask option in Photoshop or smart sharpen or use Adobe Camera Raw with the texture slider and the clarity slider to add some general sharpness to the image. Color, luminosity and detail. You hit those. Luminosity values, add some contrast. Increase the black point in the image using ACR as a filter. This is the same thing you would do in Lightroom. If those things are unfamiliar to you, I totally understand. Visit some of the other videos on the channel so that you can see all of that. But what I wanted you to take away from this one is the subject of the final thoughts of this video because it's getting a little long and we've reached some of the major points that I wanted to discuss. So let's have those final thoughts and finish up for today. The vital takeaway from this, from episode 12 and 13, is problem solving to help you not feel anxiety while you work in Photoshop. Because so many people that I talk to, they, they're either working with Lightroom or other third-party programs that use a lot of AI technology, and they're afraid to step into something more complex like Photoshop because they think it's too difficult to master. There is so much in Photoshop that you can do, and I, I do not discount that for a second. But when you take that systemic approach to the editing, when you ask yourself a question, what is the problem? Well, it's not bright enough. Then you can start exploring basic tools to brighten it. What's wrong with the colors? I can add more colors to it. And when you learn how to add those different steps of retouching, of artistically editing your image in the right sequence, you'll get the results you seek. That does take time. It does take practice. And I know that the allure of some of these other programs and AI technology is that you can do it quickly and fast and you don't have to memorize all these things. That's fine. But those programs, as I've said in other videos on the channel, they will only take you so far. And I want you to see that everything in Photoshop is right in your grasp. It's right in your fingertips. Use problem solving as a way to systemically start with the work and be able to achieve the art that you see in your mind and share it with your clients and the world. If you like the content you found in this video today, make sure to give the video a like and consider subscribing to the channel because there is new content each week debuting in photography and Photoshop education. And when you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell icon so you'll be notified of that new content when you return to the YouTubes. Thanks so much for watching today and until next time, I'll see you out there in the world of Photoshop.